This week, we're going to be covering the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. What I'm going to do is go through an overview of the Review Commission, talk a little about how the decisions affect current safety professionals, give tips for safety professionals, and then I want to go through some specific Review Commission cases. The Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission as we discussed last week, was created as part of the OSHA Act in 1970. It is an independent agency of the executive branch. That means it does not answer to any departmental or cabinet positions. Sort of like EPA in that regard. It's uh, an independent agency of the executive branch. And it, it's composed of three members. These are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The mission of the Review Commission is to provide fair and timely adjudication of workplace safety and health disputes between the Department of Labor and employers. Currently it has three members on it that are uh, it, ha it has the full three member component. Uh, there was about a year when it did not but those positions have recently been filled. The chair is Thomasina Rogers, Heather McDougall, and Cynthia Atwood. And just a little bit about each of these. Uh, Thomasina Rogers is currently the chair. She was first appointed in 1998 and was previously chair of the commission from 1999 to 2002. She's also the prior head of the Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Cynthia Atwood was confirmed in August of, uh, 19, of 2013. Prior, prior to her appointment on the Review Commission, she had 30 years experience as a federal lawyer and judge. And the most recent appointment is Heather McDougall. She was confirmed in March of 2014, and she served previously as Chief Legal Counsel to the Chair in the years of 2002 to 2003. A little bit about the relationship between OSHA and the Review Commission. The Review Commission was cre created by the OSHA Act, but operates as a completely independent agency. The Review Commission decisions influence how OSHA interprets enforcement actions on some regulations, and we're going to go through some decisions later, and we'll be doing some of those as class projects, and, and, and it's really useful to, to understand this because it can give you some guidance on what OSHA does in terms of its enforcement actions and interpretation on different things that may be somewhat confusing. What's the process leading to a Review Commission case review? First of all, an employer or employee is, is cited, and the in-house administrative remedies that OSHA has are unable to be um, utilized for, for whatever reason, so the con citation is still contested. The um, contested employer or employee then has an opportunity to appeal to the Review Commission, and uh, at that point, the Review Commission will open a case file. The case will be assigned to an administrative law judge, and depending upon the complexity of the case, it may follow either a formal or a simplified proceeding. In a formal proceeding, uh, you can have discovery, uh, hearing and post-hearing brief and argument, and this is used in uh, very complex cases. A simplified hearing can be requested by either party. There are no formal pleadings, and these require that both sides sit down and talk to try to narrow down the issues. In review commission cases, the burden of proof is on OSHA. OSHA is represented by an attorney who must prove the cited violations, and the employer or employee can choose to appear with or without counsel. Administrative law decisions are written decisions. They can either affirm, modify, or vacate the citation, and the decision of the administrative law judge becomes final in 30 days unless one of the parties involved requests a review by the three um, review commissioners in, in Washington, D.C. If any of the commissioners directs the case to be reviewed, they will review the following, the evidence, the briefs, the arguments, and the administrative law judge decision. They will then render a decision to affirm, modify, or vacate citations and penalties that have been proposed by OSHA. Now, this doesn't have to be the end of the story. There are legal remedies beyond the uh, OSHRC. If not satisfied with the OSHRC ruling, either party, that's the employer, employee, or OSHA, has 30 days to appeal the decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals. 
if the um, commissioners refuse to hear the case, either party has a right to appeal the administrative law judge's decision directly to the Court of Appeals, and they can continue the, the appeal process all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, why is this important to know as a safety professional? Well, the Review Commission decisions can affect safety professionals by influencing OSHA interpretation of standards and how they're cited, influencing OSHA evidence collection and record keeping related to citation, and influencing when OSHA cites willful and repeated violations based on past decisions from the Review Commission. Now, for safety professionals, the best time to prepare yourself or your organization to contest citations is before they occur. And you can do this by knowing and complying with all OSHA regulations, keeping meticulous records, research and oversee any contractors that you hire, and retain qualified legal counsel who understands how to uh, deal with these cases. You should be organized and maintain records related to compliance for any training, any testing, which soils, equipment, PPE, maintenance of any equipment, scaffolds, etc. Be, if you have your records, you'll be a little bit ahead of the game if uh, you need to come before the review commission. And if you hire anybody, make sure you do your homework and research them. Look and see if they've had any OSHA violations in the past. Look at their workers' comp rate classifications. Request and review training materials and documentation of that training. And ask other people that they work for. Also, if they're at another site, make or your site, make unannounced site visits. And um, this way you will be um, a little bit more aware of the type of contractor that you will be hiring. And finally, retain legal counsel that's experienced in the area of occupational safety and health. They can really help you. They can help you contest citations, investigate legal precedents on citations, properly prepare witnesses for testimony, and decide whether contesting citation is the best course of action, i.e. is it better to pay or to play. Now what I'd like to do is go through some specific review commission cases. Now all these cases that I'll be going through are posted on Canvas and you can read them. I'm going to be going through these rather quickly. I'm not going to read everything on the slide. I just want to give you a general overview of what's involved in a review commission case. The first one that I wanted to talk about is the Secretary of Labor versus American Bridge Company. This is docket number 090130. And I'm going to go through the background, the accident, citations, contestant citations, the hearing testimony, argument and counterargument, what the judge said, and what happened. The reason that I wanted to talk about this is this occurred on Kentucky Lake, which is, which is local. And the Army Corps of Engineers was the primary responsible party for the completion of the project. This is a, a lock addition to widen the, the navigation lock on Kentucky Dam. And it involved the movement of uh, seven downstream transmission towers, relocating Highway 62. And the cost of the project was approximately $532 million. This just gives you an idea of where the project was. Those of you that are, have gotten degrees from here earlier and are familiar with the area have probably driven by there on more than one occasion. The company who was cited was the American Bridge Company. This is an older company formed in 1900 when J.P. Morgan consolidated 27 companies under the name of American Bridge Company. It specializes in bridge construction and they were selected to build the new downstream bridges. On June 13, 2008, an iron worker fell approximately 70 feet, resulting in a fatality. As a result, OSHA conducted an inspection of the bridge project and issued American Bridge Company serious and willful citations on December 11, 2008. <clears throat> Just as definitions, a serious means a hazard, violation, or condition such that there is a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result. Willful occurs when an employer knows that a hazardous situation exists and makes no reasonable attempt to eliminate it, commits such a violation intentionally and knowingly. The serious violations were listed here, failing to have guarding, as you, as you can see, for the different um, type, type of protection, failing to secure bolt buckets, etc. And the total penalties, penalties for the serious violations were $20,000. The willful violation 
was for failing to protect employees exposed to fall hazards of approximately 70 feet while working without fall protection. The total willful penalties were $70,000 and the total proposed fine was $90,000. Now before the hearing, the, bar the parties had settled on the violations alleged in the serious citation. This only left the willful citation to be contested. In this case, the secretary had to prove the following. The applicability of the cited standard, the employer's noncompliance with the standard's terms, the employee access to the violative conditions, and the employer's actual and constructive knowledge of the violation, i.e. whether the employer knew or, with the exercise of reasonable diligence, could have known of the violative con conditions. The hearing occurred before Administrative Law Judge Ken Welsh. Due to the height of the fall, the applicability of the standard was quickly established. Further testimony was needed to prove the other key points. Some of the testimony was from different individuals familiar with what occurred. One was the foreman who stated he was supervising the work at a distance of 20 feet, admitted that there were times he didn't utilize fall protection, and stated he had, quote, seen people not tied off, maybe passing a point going around something, maybe not just tied off told OSHA that there were not enough retractables for the employees to work. Three other iron workers testified as well, and they all stated they had observed other iron workers not tied off on repeated occasions prior to the accident. The Corps of Engineers engineer said that he had seen employees not tied off sometimes on a daily basis and reported it to the safety officer on the site each time. This was sufficient to show that the company had prior constructive knowledge of the situation. The counter-argument was unpreventable employee misconduct. For, for this to be upheld, it must be proven that it, it, one, established work rules designed to prevent the violation, two, adequately communicated these rules to the employees, three, taken steps to discover violations, and four, effectively enforced the rules when violations are discovered. Through the presentation of its fall protection program and citations it had issued to American Bridge Company, they tried to prove the previous two points. The unpreventable employee misconduct defense was rejected because there were no record of monitoring for hazardous conditions and failure to uniformly enforce disciplinary actions. The administrative law judge stated that because there were no records of supervisory inspections as required by the company's site plan, plan they failed to exercise reasonable diligence. He also stated that there was evidence that no one knew what the disciplinary program required. However, the secretary's arguments are not fully supported. The testimony presented evidence that the company displayed exceptional safety performance many times during the course of the project. The outcome of this case was that due to evidence presented on both sides, the willful citation was reduced to serious in nature. Due to its size, American Bridge Company received no credit in reducing the fine. The company did receive credit for having a written safety plan and having worked for two years on the project site without a lost time incident before the fatality occurred. A fine, fine, final fine of $6,000 was assessed for the violation. The next case I wanted to talk about is the Secretary of Labor versus Stern, Turning Stone Casino Resort. This is OSHRC docket number 404-1000. I'd like to go through the background of this, the situation that occurred, the citations, the supportive dismissal, the judge ruling, and the commission ruling. And, and this is uh, an interesting one to discuss because this is one where uh, one of the parties appealed the administrative law judge's ruling and it went in front of the entire commission subsequent to that. The Turning Stone Casino is owned by the Oneida Indian Nation. It's located in the nation's reservation in New York. More than 85% of its 3,000 employees are non-Indian, and all of Turning Point's revenues go to fund the nation's government and programs. I kind of selected this case because I'm from upstate New York, and um, I grew up on the shores of Cayuga Lake, and I'm very familiar with all of the heritage of the area from the Iroquois tribe, of which the Oneidas are one of them. There were the Cayugas and the Senecas and the Oneidas and the Onondagas, etc. So this, this case is, is very familiar to me and I know where this general area is when I go back to visit family in, in, in the summertime this is the area where I go. What happened on this is that OSHA inspected a kitchen at the Turning Stone Casino 
and uh, they issued three citations, two serious violations of hand protection standards and one other than serious documentation violation. On July 30th, 2004, Turn Turning Stone filed its motion to dismiss. On September 30th, 2004, the Secretary filed an opposition to motion. The types of, ci of, of citations, uh, serious, as we saw in the last uh, case, is a violation where a substantial probability that death or serious harm could result where an employer knew or should have known of the hazard. A penalty of up to $7,000 for each violation is, could be proposed. Other than serious is a violation that has a direct relationship to job safety and health, but probably would not cause death or serious harm. Turning Stone wanted the case dismissed for the following reasons. It contended that OSHA had no jurisdiction in this matter because Turning Stone is solely owned and operated by the nation, offering four specific examples. First, Congress intended that the OSHA Act of 1970 not apply to Indian tribes. Second, applying the, the Act to the nation is precluded by specific treaties between the nation and the United States. Third, Applying the Act to the Nation would touch upon exclusive rights of self-governance in purely intramural matters, and four, Executive Order 13175 requires government-to-government -government consultation should, that should occur before adversarial enforcement. Let's look at each one of these. <clears throat> the first, Congress intended that the OSHA Act of 1970 not apply to Indian tribes. The Commerce Clause, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, of the Constitution empowers Congress to, quote, regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with Indian tribes. The OSHA Act words states, the, quote, the Congress declares it shall be its purpose and policy through the exercise of its powers to regulate commerce among the several states and with foreign nations and to provide for the general welfare. Turning Point argued that since the fact that the phrase and with Indian tribes was left out of the act that established that Congress intended the act not apply to Indian tribes. The second is that applying the act to the nation is precluded by specific treaties between the nation and the United States. They argued that the application of the act in the circumstances of this case would abrogate rights guaranteed by Indian treaties. They point out that on a, on the Oneida Indian Nation is one of six nations of the um, Iroquois Confederacy, I won't pronounce the other one, but following the Revolutionary War, the United States entered into three treaties with six nations. One of these, the Treaty of Canandaigua states, the United States will never claim the same land, nor disturb them, or either of the six nations, nor their Indian friends residing thereon, and united with them, in the free use and enjoyment thereof. The Treaty of Fort Stanwix promises peaceful possessions of their lands, and free use and enjoyment of their lands. Just uh, a little aside, the Treaty of Canandaigua, my father lives in Canandaigua, he's currently 91 years old, and when I go visit in upstate New York, I go to Canandaigua. Canandaigua is a really beautiful town. Uh, Canandaigua Lake is absolutely gorgeous. It's some of the most expensive real estate in the United States. It's been in the news for a couple of things. One, the um, uh, gold medalist swimmer, Ryan Lotke, was born in Canandaigua. And the other, this, uh, this past year, the uh, NASCAR driver, Tony Stewart had a, was involved in a fatality on a racetrack in Canandaigua, New York, which you may have heard about in the news over the summer. Anyway, getting back to the, the, the talk, the, the third is that applying the act to the nation would touch upon exclusive rights of self-governance in purely intramural matters. Notes that the nation relies mainly on its casino revenues for its government funding and programs, and that the income from the casino's gaming activities is utilized to operate the government and its programs. Notes that the nation has used this income to fund health care, housing, cultural, employment, and land acquisition programs, and that without this income, very few tribal government programs would be possible. Utilizing the act to supplant the nation's own regulatory process is a clear interference with the authority of the nation to govern in intramural matters. And the last is Executive Order 1375 requires government-to-government -government consultation should occur before adversarial enforcement. This uh, executive order, which was signed by President Clinton, is titled Consultation and Coordination with Indian Tribal Governments, and it argued that since OSHA did not follow this order by trying to communicate with the tribal governments, the citations should be thrown out. Well, the judge's ruling was the follow. The, first of all, the support won for the act not applying. The judge said that in 1960, the Supreme Court held that a statute of general applicability applies to Indians and their property interests in a case that they cited. 
and appeals court have followed this rule and have found general federal laws applicable to Indian tribes, so the respondent's first assertion was rejected. The second, applying the act to the nation is precluded by specific treaties. Two circuit courts have considered treaty provisions in court cases addressing the applicability of the act to Indian enterprises on reservation lands. They're listed uh, there as the Warm Springs and the Donovan versus uh, Navajo Forest. Uh, the deciding factor in the Navajo Forest case from a passage in which the court ruled that the, it made clear that the United States government agreed to leave the Navajos alone on the reservation to conduct their own affairs with a minimum of interference from non-Indians and then only by those expressly authorized to enter upon the reservation. The court ruled that applying the act to the Indian enterprise would constitute an abrogation of Article 2 of the Navajo Treaty and in this case the the judge agreed with the decisions from the older cases and stated, I find that the application of the act under the circumstances of this, of this case would abrogate the rights set out in the three treaties involved. The support num for number three touched upon exclusive rights of self-governance in purely intermural matters. Uh, in an earlier court case, uh, Mash and Tuckett, the court noted that purely intermural matters generally involve matters such as tribal membership, inheritance rules, and domestic relations. The judge agreed with the earlier decisions, but also added that being a casino and a huge tourist attraction, that made it, I mean, it clearly had a direct effect on interstate commerce, so this assertion was rejected. And the last was quickly rejected in that the Section 10 of the order entitled Judicial Review clearly states that um, it provides no, quote, enforceable by law by a party against the United States, its agencies, or any person. So... At the conclusion of the trial, the administrative law judge stated that for the reasons set out in Section 2 of this decision, respondent's motion to dismiss the secretary's citation and complaint for lack of subject matter is granted. In other words, the administrative law judge threw out the OSHA citation against the Turning Point Casino. OSHA was not happy with this, and so the secretary appealed to the full commission. And in this case, the commission overturned the judge's decision, stating that Quote, we find that on the facts of this case, the act applies to turning stone. And they base that on the Treaty of Canandaigua. And the Treaty of Canandaigua directs that the United States will not disturb the Indians in their, quote, free use and enjoyment, unquote, of their reservation. The treaty does not contain any specific right against regulation by OSHA or any other entity or even against non-Indian entry into the reservation. So the... The conclusion of this is that the administrative law judge granted the dismissal of the citations. However, the commission, comprised of the chairman and two commissioners, overturned the ruling based upon the court, based upon the Treaty of Canandaigua, and the citation stood. So that was an example of a case where administrative law judge ruled one way, and the full commission ruled in a different manner. Now, the last case I wanted to, to talk about is the Secretary of Labor versus Constructural Dynamics Incorporated. This is docket number 07-0976. This case began in 2009 of December, where OSHA heard the case of the Secretary of Labor versus Constructural Dynamics Incorporated, also known as CDI. This is a producer and supplier of ready-mix concrete and repairs mixed trucks at uh, their Pennsylvania location. In December of 2006, a CDI welder was killed from an explosion due to mnemonic test leaking of a weld repair. OSHA inspected and issued a penalty of $4,900 based upon the general duty clause. The inspector claimed that CDI should have recognized the potential for explosive hazard during the pneumatic leak testing. What occurred was that a CDI welder was performing pneumatic leaking testing on a 200-gallon tank. This was performed to see if the, link had, the, the tank had been properly repaired during, uh, fr from the leak. The tank exploded at some time, killing the welder and damaging surrounding equipment in the facility. This is kind of an example of uh, what we're looking at here for these, the type of tanks. Uh, this is a pressure vessel over here on the, the left. This is an employee's welded repairs that you can see here over on the right. And with the fatal accident, you can see that this uh, portions of this were, uh, were were destroyed in areas that initiated the failure. 
It's a pretty violent accident. According to uh, an engineering company that investigated it, the welder was, quote, cut in half due to the explosion. The left leg was found 140 feet from the bay. The right leg was found 35 feet away, and the only remaining evidence at the scene was an air hose still attached to the tank following the explosion. What is pneumatic, pneumatic test leaking, leak testing? It involves pressurizing the vessel with air and then pouring soapy water on top of the pressurized tank. If any faulty welding exists, it can be seen through the bubbles coming from the tank. This activity had been routinely performed by CDI employees for over three decades without any incident. The vice president and safety director, Tim Kurtz, claims that only five PSI was needed in order to perform uh, successful pneumatic leak testing. The employees claimed that they used about 25 to 30, but the tanks were rated for 55 to 60 PSI. Some of the safety measures that they had in place were low pressurization, much lower than what the tanks were rated for. They had pressure gauges present, pressure relief valves, regulators, and there was no evidence of employees ever conducting leak testing without any of these devices. The secretary claimed that pneumatic leak testing was a recognized hazard under the general duty clause for this industry and specifically for CDI. They referred to the tank manufacturer's warning which stated that, quote, welding or repairing may weaken the water tank causing it to explode. If tank is damaged or worn, it should be replaced with new equipment. The secretary gave further warnings of this, quote, some, some of them uh, were, do not pressurize empty tanks, and warning, danger, overpressurizing can cause explosive discharge of air pressure, water, and metal fragments. The secretary alluded to the known hazards of pneumatic integrity testing, but not to, and, and, and pressure testing, excuse me. Secretary brought in some individuals to testify. The testimony and expertise of professional engineer John Mooney, who had a Master of Science degree in stress analysis, had corporate experience in pressure vessel tanks and piping, worked at Exxon for 11 years and mobile for 20. He testified that, quote, tanks can fail due to defects in material, corrosion, or other defects, and that certain defects could cause the tank to fail before it reaches design pressures. Quote, the common knowledge among experts that mnemonic testing of pressurized text tanks constitutes a hazard to employees. And he based this on the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Boyle uh, Pressure Code. Now, there were, there were weaknesses in the Secretary's claim. The first and, and one of the more important is that pneumatic integrity testing and pressure testing are not synonymous with pneumonic leak testing. The citation stated the recognized hazard violation was regarding pneumatic leak testing, not integrity testing. Warning labels directed at the leak testing on a, on a vessel after it had, were not directed at, at leak testing were on a vessel after it had been removed from the truck, and warning vessel labels rather referred to, quote, the concern that inflating a tank with air when on a truck could result in the tank sucking up air intended for the air brakes. Due to its small size, the water tanks are exempt from the cited ASME code. CDI had the following defense that they did not recognize the explosion hazard during pneumatic leak testing. Um, Tim Kurtz testified that CDI recognized the potential hazard of tank explosion during pneumatic integrity testing, but, quote, there's generally no such hazard when conducting pneumatic leak testing, and that none of the, his industry sources identified these hazards with leak testing. When asked about CDI's knowledge before the accident, a uh, fleet manager told the secretary that anything can happen regardless of what it is, you know, could explode, you know, break. The secretary asked for clarifications of the circumstances in which a tank could fail even though pressurization was below its rated limits. And Don's statement was, I really can't tell you, I mean, anything could happen. This case file alludes to Don's statement as a deciding factor in, in, in this case. What the final decision was, uh, was based came from the administrative law judge uh, Kovat Rooney. The, the final decision was based on the idea that recognition that anything can happen is not sufficient to establish actual recognition of a hazard under 5A1, the general duty clause. To prove the existence of a hazard within the general duty clause, the secretary cannot merely show that there may be some de degree of risk to employees, and Rooney ordered that the citation and the proposed penalty be vacated. 
this went before the review commission and they stated that we have examined the record in its entirety, considered the arguments of the parties, and affirmed the judge for the reasons stated in her decision. The chairman and the commissioners claimed that the expert witness significantly undermined the secretary's case. As a follow-up, uh, CNA Insurance posted a bulletin on their website concerning this fatal accident. In this bulletin, the investigation of the uh, pressure vessel that exploded the um, engineering company determined that the uh, subject pressure vessel was defective as designed and manufactured and that these defects were the primary cause of the explosion. Therefore, the uh, CNA Insurance posted a bulletin on their website to inform companies in this industry of the accident and the findings and the recommendation regarding pneumatic leak testing and tanks subject to repair should be hydrostatically tested for potential leakage whenever possible. Pneumatic testings of these tanks should not be performed due to the safety concerns identified in the report. The incident tragically underscores the inherent hazard of using pressurized air to perform leak checks. Gases are compressible by nature and when pressurized contain considerable potential energy that can lead to such catastrophes. So anyway, that's a, an overview of the Review Commission and some of the things that they look at as they um, decide cases. We're going to be doing some uh, presentations a little later and you'll have an opportunity to, to hear some more Review Commission cases. Next week we're going to be looking at how OSHA regulations have been challenged in the court and the effect that that has had on the regulatory process.